Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Jim Allister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I want to begin by um, commending the Health Minister for his, the leadership he has shown and has given in this matter. It's good to have a steady hand on the tiller at this time. And of course, he represents across our health service uh, some of the most selfless, committed uh, individuals that keep this service going. And with others, I would want to pay a heartfelt tribute to them for all they have done and for all that they yet will have to do, because I suspect we don't know the half of it at this point. Uh, so to health service workers and to all who are keeping the machinery of government and particularly of health moving, a, a very big thank you. Some members have referred to this legislation that we're discussing as um, very draconian, and that's a, a fair enough description, although I suppose when you think of um, the individual that gives rise to that phrase, draconian. Uh, uh, Dracon was a leader in the 7th century BC in Athens who reached considerable notoriety for the very harsh penal codes that he imposed. And, uh, well, uh, yeah, the, uh, not quite, uh, but the, um, the honourable member who interrupts from a senatorial position, most surprising given his uh, august status in this House as a principal deputy speaker, I'm sure is a well-read well gentleman he knows all about, Dracon. Uh, but uh, he introduced various uh, penal codes, which for the most trivial of offences, as well as the most serious, uh, decreed that the penalty was death. Uh, so I don't think uh, we're, we're quite uh, as bad as that, but make no mistake about it, these are proposals which none of us as legislators should be at ease with, because these are stripping out rights and protections that all of us should value. Uh, yes? Grateful to the member for giving way. Earlier in the debate, I referred to the Special Powers Act. The member will recall the Special Powers Act was introduced in 1922 and was renewed every year that the old Northern Ireland Parliament sat. That being the case, does the member recognise there, there is an inherent danger? And I say this as a politician. Once politicians acquire power over people, they are often reluctant to return it to the people. I absolutely agree and uh, to all intents and purposes this is a special powers act because uh, by its very essence it is removing the norm it is removing the hedge of protection that uh, is in place and it is giving extraordinary powers of a summary nature to government and mike nesbitt in his speech articulated some of those points very clearly so none of us should shrug and say, uh, just let's do this. These are serious measures that have been taken. And indeed, it's notable in this legislation that the acts that can be taken by government have been placed at the lowest possible level in terms of how they can be taken. Oh. These matters are to be perfected by a statutory rules rather than statutory instruments. So a statutory rule can be made, as this House knows, very, very preemptively uh, without effective scrutiny. There may be retrospective scrutiny, but there's no prospective scrutiny. Uh, and therefore, uh, the, the very powers that we're giving away, we're giving away at the cheapest possible price of mere uh, statutory rules. And we're doing it in legislation, which not only can last for two years, which does seem to me longer than it needs to be at this point in time, 
but legislation which can be extended in six-month bites. So it isn't just a case that there is a cut-off point after two years. This is legislation which can be extended incrementally. And uh, uh, that can be done in Northern Ireland by a Northern Ireland department uh, taking these powers and extending them. So these are serious matters that we should not be meekly uh, accepting. And I do have to say something I referred to yesterday. I'm made even more uneasy about the exercise of these powers by virtue of the fact that simultaneously we have stripped out of this House many of the oversight scrutiny powers which we as MLAs had. I refer to the fact that yesterday, without debate, on a vote on the Nod, we removed from this House the right of MLAs to table oral or topical questions to any minister, to any minister, on any issue. And that coinciding with the very same moment that we're about to give those ministers the most extraordinary powers. And yet, instead of thinking that might be a time to amplify, to increase scrutiny, to add to the opportunity to question, we go in the very opposite direction. And as a House, we remove from MLAs the right to ask an oral question. And we actively discourage the asking of written questions. That to me, Mr Deputy Speaker, is a House that's headed in the wrong direction in circumstances such as these. Yes? Is it not the case that um, parliamentary questions, whether being oral or written, are not just for the purposes of scrutiny, but also to inform the ministers of and highlight issues? I know, certainly from my perspective, when I ask assembly questions, I don't do it for an answer, I do it to raise an issue. And I think almost we are having suggestions that the Northern Ireland Executive intends to create a portal, almost reinventing the wheel of what Northern Ireland Assembly questions are intended for. So whilst I appreciate the, the concern around um, limiting questions because of the, the, the considerable amount of work that they, that they endure, um, is, is the Northern Ireland Executive uh, removing an opportunity to raise issues that those at the Executive table might not find themselves on the ground? Uh, yes, I, I think the member makes a valid point. Um, very often the question is asked not so much with great expectation as to the answer, because sometimes the answers can be disappointing in just how opaque they are, uh, but in order to put the focus on an issue. And here we are heading into territory where we have bestowed on executive ministers, yes, in a time of great extremis, yes, in a time when it's necessary to give extra powers, but not at a time when it's necessary simultaneously to remove powers of scrutiny. And that is uh, my gripe about this matter, that we are coinciding the excessive increase, or no, I'll not say excessive, the, because much of it is necessary, the increase in powers to executive ministers, we're coinciding that with a time when we are surrendering and downgrading the right to ask questions in this House. And that of an executive, which I'm going to frankly say, a week ago, couldn't agree when our schools could be shut. An executive that was pulling in opposite directions. That is not a, the past few weeks in that regard was not a confidence building measure. And now, therefore, to see that we have bestowed upon 
those ministers. And we're effectively going to have, without question time, we're going to have government by press conference. Now, of course, it's necessary, it's right, to keep the public fully informed. But this is an elected house for a purpose. And the purpose should be uh, that ministers convey through this house as much as they can to those we represent. Yes? The member for Given Way, but I want to bring some clarity, Mr Deputy Speaker, to what was agreed. Uh, I think uh, the uh, political party sought to act in a responsible way by freeing up ministers to deal with the crisis in hand. People are literally dying outside of here. And we wanted to ensure that ministers would be freed up by not having to answer lots of questions to raise issue. The health minister alone at that point had over 800 questions on his desk. And therefore, there was agreement reached, as uh, the members' uh, independent groups ought to know, that ministers gave a commitment from the executive to come before this House and make a statement to this House and answer as many questions as were needed. Uh, by members, so scrutiny will prevail, albeit uh, uh, in a different way. Well, well, the member makes a valiant effort to dress it up, but the reality is that a facility that existed for MLAs to ask the questions that were on their minds of ministers about actions they were taking in their departments has been stripped out and taken away. And in its place, we have the offer that ministers may, at their discretion, by and large, come to this House, make a statement and answer or dodge such questions as they wish. That is a very poor substitute, and it is not something that I believe needed to be done. The reference to 800 questions uh, to Minister Swan, <laughs> that was 800 questions of written form. We are talking about a minister coming to this House once every two or three weeks and ask, answering maybe half a dozen questions. That's what we're talking about in the scale of things. And yet that facility has been removed. I simply make the point. I do not think that that in these circumstances is healthy uh, and it is not a step which should have been taken. But taken, it has been. Could I just uh, make a few miscellaneous points for the Minister's consideration. Under this bill, as I read it, uh, there are some, and somebody already referred to the fact that the, the powers are expressed pretty vaguely, uh, and maybe for a reason. But is there a power in this legislation to compel a factory, for example, to close? No. I have had representations today from constituents of mine who are working in, in factories in my constituency and in the minister's constituency, who, by virtue of the sort of employment it is on an assembly line or on a production line, are effectively working shoulder by shoulder. Now, that makes a mockery of all we are told about social distancing. Uh, yet, what is the capacity to deal with that situation? Now, of course, it would be the ultimate extreme action to close such a factory. But if such, a, if such an extreme action was necessary, is the power within this bill to do it? Or does it lie elsewhere? Or does it fall within that clause about stopping gatherings uh, and closing premises. Does that extend to closing factories? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Uh, but it's the sort of vagueness that Mr Nesbitt was talking about uh, in his contribution. I think we need some clarity about issues like that. Where, Minister, does this legislation sit with the Civil Contingencies Act of 2004? Is there a crossover? Are we going to rely on both? Because, of course, under it, there are also extraordinary powers that can be taken. Uh, I don't read this bill as superseding those. And are we going to see a mix and a match of those powers? Uh, and should it be made clear to the public that it's not just the powers 
that are in this bill, the Short Route of Common Act, but also that which is in the Civil Contingencies Act. And um, if it comes to it, and things get as bad as is feared, are we going to be fettered in any way in calling in the necessary support of the army in this part of the United Kingdom? Is there going to be any fetter on that? There certainly shouldn't be, but is there? Can I ask the minister, if we get to a point where our hospitals, particularly in the border, are being overrun by people from outside the jurisdiction, anxious for help, are there steps we can or would or should take in that regard? Are there powers within this bill to allow the minister to act to deal with that extreme situation? Yes? Uh, I know the member likes to look for areas which may be provocative and cause tension, etc. That's a stage. But is, is he seriously suggesting we should stop cross-border healthcare? What if patients from South Armagh or South Down or Derry or whatever go across the border seeking health care? Are you suggesting that if we block the border, that the southern authorities should block you their side of the border? Surely what he should be seeking at this time is cross-border cooperation in our health care and looking after our loved ones, rather than trying to create a problem which should be a solution. I don't think I'm trying to create a problem. I'm asking what I think is a legitimate question. If we should, in the extreme of this situation, arise at a point where the National Health Service facilities in this part of, uh, of the United Kingdom are put beyond breaking point because of an influx from outside this jurisdiction, is it not a fair and legitimate question to ask? Does the minister have the powers to deal with that situation and to remedy that situation? I think he should. Uh, but the member thinks he shouldn't. Well, then maybe it is he who's vetting his politics override his judgment. Yes. Call, I think it was in 2001, uh, the outbreak of foot and mouth that took place in Northern Ireland. And on that occasion, the Army was deployed to help deliver essential supplies. At that time, I think we had uh, a government up and running at Stormont that included all parties. So there's no legitimate reason why people could object. Yep. Uh, the uh, member, I think, is right in what he says. And, uh, you know, I don't see this as a green and orange issue. This virus is colourless as far as that is concerned. But it does concern me somewhat that in recent weeks it was the greenery of some people's view that led their thinking about the schools needing to close. Because it had been done south of the border, it had to be done north of the border. I think it was those people who were allowing their politics to rule their head in this matter. And will that same politics rule their head if it comes to the need for army support? That's a legitimate question to which we need an answer from those who want to uh, make politics out of this situation. Let them tell us. If it comes to it, and we need army support in this province to get through this crisis, are they going to stand behind that and support that? Or is that trumped by their politics? You know, there's no time for that. And I trust that won't be the situation. I'll leave it there. I call Jerry Carl. Speaker, and I want to begin by giving my thoughts uh, to everybody who's been forced to self-isolate. 